It's January 21st, 1934, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. We're all familiar with the stereotype of the philandering French, but it was on this day in 1934 that a Parisian man named Henri Littier went to extreme lengths to curb his wife's infidelities by fitting her with a replica medieval chastity belt. Yeah, it's the strangest story. Henri Littier and his wife Suzanne had marital problems, which basically amounted to her just not being able to be anything but unfaithful to him. The story then goes on to say that uh, the Littiers visited together various museums to research about chastity belts. And it was at this point that he got the idea to presumably solve his marital woes by designing for his wife a chastity belt. He was eventually sentenced to three months in prison uh, for this crime. And he was fined 50 francs for cruelty to his wife. And this is the... I can't decide what I think about it thing. Um, (laughs) Because on the one hand, she genuinely seems to have said to him, I have a problem with infidelity and I want to be faithful to you and I am cooperating in this endeavour and I would like to have a chastity belt fitted. On the other hand, to actually put one of those on your wife is an act of domestic abuse, effectively, whether or not you've managed to groom her into thinking that's what she wants to do. But then you have the extra layer on top of it, comedy that was put onto it by the people who were reporting it at the time. So this is this is what was written in Time magazine, right? Austere institution. I mean, admittedly, obviously, in a kind of, it must be true, I read it in the tabloids part of the mag. But this is what it said. Because some amorous Frenchman was also a tattletale... Henri Littier, baker and husband, was last week hailed before a black-gowned judge of the Paris Correctional Court. A student of medieval life, Baker Littier had locked his frisky wife into a belt of steel and velvet. Monsieur le juge, Madame Littier bagged, Henri may perhaps be a bit crazy, but I am too. I cannot look at a man without running after him. Yeah, so it's kind of telling of the level of accuracy that was expected in international news reporting at a time when you knew no one was going to follow up. But almost everything in that is wrong. Henri Littier wasn't a baker. He worked for the French Mint. He was a moneymaker. His wife is often, in all the English language reports, she was named as Juliette, but her name was actually Suzanne. And this whole scene of her prostrating herself before the court and saying, oh, if Henri is crazy, so am I. I couldn't find any account that that had happened. But I did find some French reports, by putting that degree of mine to good use, that sort of un- that explain, a, well, they shed some light and they raise more questions on exactly what was going on between the two of them. And what becomes obvious is that we're looking at a very dysfunctional relationship. He had been in court two years earlier. He'd been charged with locking his wife up inside their home. They had a lot of rows. There was violence as well. But the French magazine Detective in March 1934 carried a report of this trial and it described how the couple visited an orthopaedic shop three times, once to research and place their order, second time for a fitting. And apparently on trying on the steel brace, Madame Littier said it was, quote, a little cold. Mm. And then finally for pickup where it was attached to her and Henri pocketed the key and off they went. It does seem to be these more florid reports in the English language press about how he was inspired by a visit to the medieval exhibit at the Cluny Museum and stuff. But at least according to those reports of the day, Suzanne was a willing participant in this odd plan. And there was actually some suspicion it might have been a sex thing. Yeah, well, that would be my suspicion. It sounds like a sex thing. And a a journalist who did not have the language to talk about that at the time. Yeah, and so the neighbour who originally reported Henri to the authorities, he had apparently witnessed some kind of scenes. Like, they didn't... At the time, I think they wouldn't go into the specifics. But he told the court, when I make love, I close the window and draw the curtains. Mm. So you're getting the sense that maybe they were exhibitionists as well. Well, the whole history of chastity belts themselves is riddled with historical Mm. confusion. Because we think now, and by we, I just mean the general public, uh, you know, haven't spent hours looking into this. (laughs) We think now of of medieval maidens being locked up by, you know, the knights that go off to fight whatever they're up to, putting these women into chastity belts. But that whole concept basically came about with the Victorians Mm. who made replicas of chastity belts or this fictional thing they'd heard of from a few centuries prior, which was probably satire. 
and then put them in the museums and people for a long time thought they were medieval chastity belts when they weren't because they never existed. Yeah, despite Littier's apparent inspiration from seeing medieval devices, there's no evidence that chastity belts were any more common in the 1430s than they were in the 1930s. In both periods, if it ever happened, it was basically a couple of crazy dudes rather than a thing. (laughs) There are mentions of chastity belts in medieval texts, but they are mostly religious metaphors. So it'll be something like, you know, your belt of chastity and your shield of virtue. So that no one's actually talking about wearing a chastity belt. There's really only one detailed description of a chastity belt, and it's really not supported by much physical evidence from this era. But it was first mentioned in a treatise on siege machines that was written by Konrad Kaiser von Eichstadt in 1405. And Kaiser was a German... German engineer and artist, and he had this sort of concept of uh, a chastity belt as an afterword in his treatise that was really all just about these kind of medieval machines that were used in castle-to-castle combat. But at the time, even, it was regarded as being an imaginative joke, and even then went on to be the topic of satire. Well, it's a hand-drawn illustration, and then he writes next to it, these are hard iron breeches of Florentine women, which are closed at the front. It may have literally been a joke about Florentine women not being up for it. So, I mean, yes, it is a sort of austere book about military technology, but it's got a blokey sense of humour. Some of the other things described in the book, which are called Bella Fortis, a cat-shaped chariot, invisibility devices, and fart power propulsion. So I think Kaiser had one of those weird German senses of humour, you know what I mean? Yes, but it was taken as a source for a long time that medieval people literally wore chastity belts, mm. and there isn't a shred of evidence to that. And when they have metal dated the ones that they had in museums, they've realised that they're much more recent than that. And it makes sense, doesn't it, that it came from the Victorian era because the Victorians, unlike the medieval people, the Victorians actually were obsessed with preventing masturbation, prudish about even talking about the downstairs departments, particularly on women. It makes sense that they would be the ones that would invent this stuff. Yeah, and ironically, the 19th century saw the creation of what are the only actual chastity belts we have proof of, which are chastity belts for men, aimed yeah. at curbing masturbation in teenage boys particularly. If the chastity belt was seen mainly as a satirical concept in medieval times, the reason that we might not pick up on that immediately is because our ideas about the sexes have shifted so much over time. So in the medieval era, and right up until the sort of 18th century, women were portrayed as being much more lustful and lacking in self-control than men. You know, the idea was that men had the self-discipline to resist, whereas women were all sort of lusty and they had to be controlled by men. So the idea of a chastity belt was really a joke about paranoid men. And so the references we do have from the time, we have things like woodcuts and prints and stuff. They would always show the man heading off with the key to the chastity belt, the woman sitting there with her chastity belt on and a hidden lover in the background with his duplicate key. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you've got the jealous husband like waving the key like I've got the key in the background and the joke is obviously like <laughs> yeah he is completely ignorant as to her sexual life yeah. isn't it that's the joke yeah there was a, a book written by Albrecht Klassen in 2007 called The Medieval Chastity Belt The Myth Making Process and in that he talks about the whole business of chastity belt myth making being similar to the way that we imagine everyone in the medieval era thought the earth was flat and what he was hypothesizing is that it stems from this same desire to demonstrate a kind of lack of civility in bygone ages that we are comparatively enlightened versus them. Mm. And I can imagine that that is sort of why so many of us, and me included, have taken it as a given that a chastity belt is a thing that existed, because we do think back to maybe all of those sort of torture devices that you see when you go on castle tours, and this just seems like an extension of one of those, something that's believable in its brutality. I suppose as well it's become a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy in the sense that, like the Blackberry, there are devotees now, aren't there? So there there are people, even though it's way out of fashion now, are still interested as a sex thing in developing something like a chastity belt. Yeah, there are multiple companies producing these things, mostly for use, I think, in BDSM contexts, but they include companies such as MySteel, NeoSteel, and the rather less evocatively named Latowski. Why haven't they called it Letier? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm going to get myself a pair of Ulrichs. <laughs> Next time. 
Henry had actually had an injury 12 years earlier, which actually sounds like it could have been much worse than this, but... Love the show? Support the show. Patreon.com slash Retrospectors. Part of the ACAST Creator Network.